Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, today's uh, wellbeing work uh, workshop. Uh, this is week two, and we're dealing with fatigue. So I'm just going to take you through a gentle start just to get uh, allow everybody to come in and join us through the waiting room. There was about 150 people who had registered for today's event. So I just would like to go through nice and sort of slowly just to allow everybody to join us uh, before we hand over to uh, Andy and Ian, who are going to take you through today's session. So this Wellbeing Workshop Week 2, um, I'm going to show you how to take part now. I'll go through a few slides with you and just let you know how you can best take part and send in your questions. So on a laptop or a PC view, you're going to see something like this. You'll have your little control panel. It may well be closed or shrunk down into the right-hand side of the screen. Um, simply click on the orange arrow and that will open and close the panel. Uh, when you do that, uh, it will expand the panel, panel up and it will give you an opportunity to then pick out and pick from the options. Uh, one of those options may be that you want to send us a question or you want to send us a bit of information in, uh, something, a comment or regarding today's presentation. Uh, please use the question panel for that. As moderator today, I'll be uh, looking over the questions and then feeding those into our two presenters. So enter your questions into the box. Once you've got the question panel open, you might have to click on the little white triangle as it says, fill in your question, don't forget to press send to pass it through. If you're on a mobile device, so if you're on a tablet or a mobile phone, you might see the uh, presentation look slightly differently. Um, what I would say is make sure you have the orientation of the phone in one direction from the beginning and keep it the same way. You're probably best on the landscape uh, we're showing here in portrait mode, just to sort of identify quickly for you where the options are, uh, but you'll probably find viewing is easiest in landscape mode. So to enter the question panel, click on the question mark, fill in your question and press the send button. There is a short survey at the end, should take no more than about five minutes or so to fill in. Um, if you can hang on the line after we close down today, then that will open the survey automatically for you and you can fill in the survey there and then for us. That will be great. And uh, we do appreciate all of your comments and we've got some great feedback from last week. Uh, so it'd be really nice to uh, continue with that each week as we go through uh, and we do read those comments that come through. So now I'm going to hand over to your presenters today, our colleagues at NFE Group. We've got Andy Neal and Ian Westmore. So good morning, guys. Uh, over to you. I'm going to disappear off into the background. I'm going to make Andy the presenter now so Andy can take over control of the screens and share his screen. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well. Uh, okay, let's just uh, get the IT sorted. Okay, well, welcome to the fatigue uh, recharging and the importance of sleep uh, presentation that we're going to do today. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, just uh, give a little bit of an intro. Um, it was very remiss of me last week in the first um, presentation. Um, I didn't really introduce myself or, or Ian. Um, uh, so I just thought I'd do that this week. Uh, firstly, thanks for all the feedback we got last week. Uh, some of it was great, some of it was, uh, you know, useful. But any feedback we get is obviously useful. This is a, this is a brand new medium for us to present. Um, I think I mentioned last week. We're very used to standing up and doing interactive workshops, but this is a, a, a new medium for us. So for those uh, observant ones amongst you, you'll notice that this week I'm wearing headphones. Um, that's hopefully because some of the feedback we got last week was a bit echoey. I am broadcasting to you live from the NFE Training Center, and this is a rather large room. Um, so normally full of people, and today it's just full of me. So uh, hence the echoey bit, but hopefully the headphones and the microphone will sort that out. So we're live from Donington Park, uh, which is back up and running. We've got cars racing around the circuit. Uh, and if I took the headphones off, I'd be hearing them. So lots of excitement going on back here. It's not open for spectators, though, it's just for the drivers and their teams. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, uh, apparently, I'm the expert. That's X as in has been and spurt as a drip under pressure, um, as uh, someone once told me. Um, I spent the first years, 10 years of my working life in the police service, uh, uh, spending nine years on traffic when the M25 opened. That just goes to show how old I am. I left in 1987 and started my own learner driving school and then went back into fleet or advanced driver training in the mid 90s um, and then started my own business in 2003. Um, and then in March this year, we were acquired by RED and we're very happy to be part of RED. We see it as a, as a great way forward. 
Uh, the well-being and resiliency side of the business um, was added to the driver training business that we'd already started in 2003 and about 2008. So we've got some 10 years experience um, in this. And coming to today's thing, the, 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 fa the fatigue element, um, this really comes from some of our corporate clients and many of our corporate clients, uh, the largest of which is uh, Network Rail, they have 36,000 employees, many of whom work on the tracks and mostly at night, obviously, because that's when the trains aren't running so they can get on and do what they need to do to keep the railways running. So night shift workers uh, obviously suffer from fatigue. So we had uh, several instances of where uh, guys fell asleep at the wheel on their way off a, off a night duty. So they started to ask us to look at doing some fatigue training as part of um, the resiliency piece that we were already running. So we'd already managed the stress piece that we covered last week. And then we went into the fatigue element of it. Um, and we found out some interesting things. Um, and, and you, like me, have probably all been in a situation where we've been tired whilst driving. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we, we, we've basically probably done what we've all done, which is open the window, get some fresh air in, open the window. That will make me feel a whole lot better. Um, and then find out five minutes later, it still doesn't. Um, like me, you probably then change the radio station from music uh, to something like a talk show where it hope, hopefully get you engaged and do that. And then, of course, you probably resorted to coffee and other stuff like that. The problem with that is that none of those are a cure for being fatigued. The only cure for being fatigued is sleep. Um, when you are tired, it is too late. You've gone beyond the point. There is no way back from being tired other than to sleep. Uh, and I guess this is the really important question. Like last week where we taught everyone how to breathe and to hydrate properly. And next week we're going to talk more about nutrition and hydration and how that affects us, our physiology and our ability to perform. Who has taught you how to do this most important of bodily functions, i.e. sleep? Um, certainly no one taught me to sleep. Uh, I was told to go to bed. I was told to go to sleep. Um, but no one actually taught me how to do it. Um, and therein lies the problem, really. If you don't know, understand what it is you're trying to do, it is very difficult to do. And sleep is not something that we do naturally anymore. We used to do sleep naturally, um, but today's modern life actually gets in the way. We'll explore how many of uh, the technological advances that we have <clears throat> these days has actually got in the way of us actually sleeping um, effectively. Last week, we talked about the heart and the brain and how the heart can overcome the ability or, or, or restrict the ability of the brain to perform cortical inhibition, your ability to think. <clears throat> well, the other thing that the, 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 the brain, it's like imagine your mobile phone. If you don't charge your mobile phone properly overnight, it doesn't work terribly well the next day or certainly doesn't work for as long. And the brain is exactly the same. If you do not charge your brain, and the only way to recharge your brain is through sleep. If you do not charge it, then it will not potentially work as well um, uh, the next day. <clears throat> so let's, how, let's just quickly discover how to make the best use of our brain. Here's some brain facts for you. It's only 2% of our body weight, but it uses 20% of the energy. So it's quite a high maintenance piece of kit in, rel in relation to all the other pieces. 73% of the brain is water. So it's hardly surprising, is it, that, that when we get dehydrated and 2% dehydration can affect our ability to concentrate by up to 20%. So that's hardly surprising if you think about that. Um, and uh, I, I have no idea why we put this next uh, line on the slide, but apparently it has 100 billion nerve cells, which I guess is quite a few. So how do we look after the brain? Well, actually, like last week's uh, resolutions to stress, it's actually quite simple in theory. We should drink two liters of water at least per day, depending on what we're doing. Obviously, if it's a hot day, we need to drink more because we're perspiring more. Um, if we're exercising more, we need to drink more. <clears throat> but as a standard, if you're sitting down and not doing that much exercise, two liters of water should be your absolute minimum to keep the brain properly hydrated. Control stress. Well, we learned how to do that last week. And a quick recap, try and change your emotion to a positive emotion, and we'll cover that more in week four. Change your emotion to a positive emotion, the glass half full, not the glass half empty. And the breathing exercises, 
in for five and out for five, in for five and out for five. And that helps to control the stress in our, in our lives. It helps to contain, controls the type of chemicals that we're producing. And we'll come back to the breathing exercises a little bit later in this presentation as well. And then we need to recharge by good and effective sleep. Okay, we'll come back to that as well. Okay, multitasking. I always get told at this point that the ladies in the uh, amongst us are so much better at multitasking. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to get involved now. Um, normally I can see this and I have a huge laugh at watching people try to do this exercise, but today I can't see any of you. So you know, I'm just going to have to laugh to myself and imagine you're all doing this. So I'd like everyone to stand up firstly, please. So if you could just stand up, move away from your computer. It's not a huge amount of exercise, but a little bit does help. So we're going to ask you to stand up. And now I'm going to ask you to stand on one leg. I don't mind which leg you stand on, left or right, whatever's more comfortable. So I've asked you to do two tasks now. I've asked you to stand and I've asked you to stand on one leg. OK, now I would like you to put your right hand in the air. And I want you to draw a square. And just continue to draw the square with your right hand while standing on one leg. Now I want you to put your left hand in the air whilst drawing the square and standing on one leg. And now I'd like you to draw the number nine. And like me, you can probably find that you've either fallen over or your hands have gone all over the place. So proof positive that multitasking is not possible, whether you're a man, a woman, a child or whatever else. Our brain is an incredible piece of equipment. However, it is best when it is performing a single task, okay? particularly a task that you have to think about. <clears throat> okay, this next slide, just to show you how brilliant your brain is and how immensely clever your brain is and how learning to read at school is absolutely completely irrelevant. So for those that have got kids off school at the moment, don't worry about it because it's not important. I want you to read out aloud this paragraph when it comes up. So read it out aloud where you are nice and loud to yourself. Okay, here we go. So there we go. Proof positive again that the brain is an incredible piece of equipment. Proof positive that learning to spell at school is completely unimportant, particularly in the days of spell check or whatever. <clears throat> so the brain is extremely powerful, but only when properly charged. So sleep. Sleep is one of the most basic of human functions. But Many of us struggle to get enough. Some simple changes, however, can make a big difference. And that's what we're going to explore as we move forward here. Sleep loss can affect fluctuations in your blood pressure, heart rhythms, and digestions. Last week, we were learned that too much stress is producing cortisol and adrenaline, and how cortisol or too much cortisol and too much adrenaline can cause uh, or be contributive factors towards heart disease, cancer, and certain and type two diabetes. So now we're starting to learn that sleep or lack of sleep can also affect our health. <clears throat> Insomniacs are four times more likely to experience relationship problems. You need to know your sleep cycle so that you can prepare for a good sleep. But of course, knowing your sleep cycle does rely on knowing what a sleep cycle is. Um, knowledge is power, as they say. So what we've got to do, we're going to get you interactive again now. So what we've got is a little poll here. So I'm going to open up this here and go to polls, which is my first experience of doing an online poll. So hopefully we get it right. Select poll. So I'm going to bring this poll up and then I need you to answer the question, please. So there we go. That should all be there for you. How long is a sleep cycle? 45 minutes, one hour, one hour 30, 
or two hours. Okay, the poll's open. Please go in and make your selections. Well, it must be working because I'm getting lots of people. Some of you are even correct. Fifty-seven percent of you have voted so far. Come on, it's not a hard question. Well, it might be a hard one, but <clears throat> give you another ten, twenty seconds. Forty-five minutes, one hour, one hour, thirty minutes, or two hours. How long is a sleep cycle? Okay, just about to close the poll. Okay, sharing the poll results there. So 46%. Just under half of you think it's 45 minutes. 14% think it's an hour. 20% think it's an hour and 30 minutes. 20% think it's two hours. So 20% of you knew the answer, but which 20% I hear you see. It's one hour and 30 minutes. So a sleep cycle is one hour and 30 minutes in length. <clears throat> okay. Go back to the presentation. Uh, hide. Um, bear with me. There we have it. So, sleep cycles. Okay, hopefully, we're on sleep cycles. Repeat every 1.5 hours or one hour and 30 minutes. Uh, or 90 minutes, as we'll come back to shortly. <clears throat> so typical sleep behavior. It goes through four stages of sleep. And again, we'll cover these off more later as we go through about what each one does and how important it is. So we have waking or almost awake. We have dreaming, which is the REM stage. And then we have light sleep and deep sleep. Okay. So the four elements of sleep. Again, I'll cover off more what they do. So next poll question. How long is the perfect sleep? How long is the perfect sleep? Okay, poll. Need to go to poll two, which uh, is the perfect sleep. And launch. Okay, the poll is now open. So is the perfect sleep seven hours? seven hours 30 minutes eight hours or eight hours 30 minutes <clears throat> okay eight hours is racing ahead here in popularity 52 percent currently so is the myth of eight hours sleep being the perfect sleep a myth or is it the truth 50 percent of you think it's the truth Seven hours, seven hours, 30 minutes, eight hours, eight hours, 30 minutes. I'll give you a clue for those that haven't voted yet. If a sleep cycle is one and a half hours, only one of these answers is divisible by one and a half. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And I'm going to share the results. <clears throat> And you have selected 49% uh, at eight hours, 26% seven hours, 30 minutes. So 26% of you have the correct answer. The perfect sleep is five sleep cycles, which obviously at 90 minutes each equals seven hours and 30 minutes. So the eight hour myth is actually a myth. So I'll get back to the presentation. So, <clears throat> so the eight hour myth is exactly a myth. Uh, seven and a half hours would be the perfect sleep for most of us. So five sleep cycles. Um, I'm going to refer to a book later on and in, and, and in that book about sleep from the sleep experts. 
the theory is that you don't need to do that every night. Obviously, it's not always possible to do seven hour, half hour sleep. Um, three to four perfect sleeps a week would be the ideal scenario. OK, and you can always top up with naps. Again, we'll come back to naps a little bit. So the circadian rhythm. What is the circadian rhythm? I'm just going to hide that. Uh, OK. Circadian rhythm and natural body clock. What's the natural body clock? What does that actually mean? The importance of light okay, in our lives. Um, and you will probably find that you sleep better in the winter months than you do in the summer months when the light starts coming through the window or around the side of the curtains um, earlier on in the morning. When are we naturally tired? We all know that obviously it's normal for us to sleep at night um, and that's why the night shift workers struggle because they're being asked to stay awake and work when most of us are in bed asleep. Um, and if I go back to the 70s and 80s when I was a police officer working shift work, if I was doing nights, I was pretty much the only person out there other than the baker and the milkman. Um, nowadays, if you're around at two or three o'clock in the morning, you're not alone. There's an awful lot more people in this life today working night shifts or antisocial hours or evening shifts or early shifts. Shift work is now much more prevalent than, than it was back 20, 30 years ago. So when are we naturally tired? Well, we're naturally tired between two and three in the morning and then weirdly between two and three in the afternoon. So if you think about what all our, uh, all our friends and cousins in Southern Europe do in the afternoon, the French, the Spanish, the Italians, the Greeks, what do they all do after a lunch? They go and have a nap. Why do they do that? Because they're listening to their bodies. They are just listening to what their body wants to do. But being British, of course, we have to fight through that. We push through that and we'll make sure that we do. Uh, we just keep working, which is not what our body wants to do. And seasonal variations as well. We've got long, uh, lighter nights now. Um, and obviously during the winter, we have much shorter days. So again, our sleep is affected by the seasonality as well. So part of the circadian rhythm is your chronotype. I, I put a nice picture of an island up there. The reason I've done that is because it actually the island is plays an important part in what we're gonna discuss, or certainly how we would live if we lived on an island. And I'll, can cover that shortly. So what is your chronotype? Are you a morning lark? Are you someone that gets up early, is, is full of the joys of spring in the morning, like, like, my, uh, like my wife, Vanessa? Um, or are you an in-betweener? Do you like to get up a little bit later? Can you do both ends? Can you do morning and night? Or are you a night owl? I was chatting to Ian yesterday and he used to run nightclubs, so he used to be a night owl. I used to be a night owl. You can change and you can actually move between these. I used to be a night owl. I never used to go to bed before midnight. And nowadays I'm always in bed by half eight, nine o'clock at night. Uh, that's just the way it is. I think having lived with Vanessa for 20 years has probably done me that because she's waking up at 5, 5.30 in the morning. So I've, I've moved to, to not quite that early, but a similar style where I'm now probably, I'm probably an in-betweener, I would think, but probably more a morning lark than a night out. But but why is this important? Well, like understanding that hour and a half is a sleep cycle and the elements of a sleep cycle, and whilst understanding that five cycles is the perfect cycle, it's also important to know when we are best to perform. Did you know that in football, if they're playing an evening game and there's a penalty shootout, and the penalty shootout in an evening game would probably take place at what, 10, 10.30 at night, potentially? They're playing in Europe, possibly 11, 11.30 at night. If you're someone who's a, a, a lark, a morning lark, and performs better first thing in the morning, your manager might not actually choose you to do the shootout. Um, if you think about athletes when they're playing, when they're in the Olympic Games, some of the qualifying rounds are at nine o'clock in the morning, whereas they may used to be performing at like four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So sports scientists these days are very aware and they make sure that they know and they try to educate and train their athletes to be able to perform when they need to. So before they can do that, it's obviously really important to understand what chronotype you are. <clears throat> Last week, we talked about evolution. We talked about living in a cave. We talked about our reaction when the snake pulls out in front of us in the morning. Um, we're going to talk about evolution again, and we've got this lovely picture of the island again. Living with nature, 
I want you to imagine how you would have lived if you lived on an island. You've got no TV, you've got no heating, you've got no light, you've got no stress, you've got no mortgage, you've got none of that. Um, and for two million years since we've been on this planet, we've had light, we've had daytime and we've had nighttime. And for two million years, that is all we had, other than perhaps a campfire that we may have built for ourselves. So for two million years, we've woken up when it gets light and we've gone to sleep when it's gone dark. Obviously as well, temperature changes. Temperature changes, it gets warmer during the day and it gets cooler in the evenings. So for centuries, for two million years, we've, got, we've, got, we've gone to sleep when it gets cooler and we've got up when it gets warmer. Central heating, incidentally, wasn't invented until the 1950s. So for two million years, less the last 70, we've had no central heating. Evolution isn't that quick. Our bodies haven't changed. So we need to understand what it is that we're doing that stops us from sleeping. The sleep chemical that we need, the chemical that we need to produce, and we produce this naturally, by the way, you can actually buy it from a chemist, but it's much better if you produce it naturally, it's called melatonin. And melatonin is produced when two things happen. When it starts to get dark, melatonin is produced. And when it starts to get cooler, melatonin is produced. We naturally produce them. So for two million years, we were absolutely fine because we worked all day, we got to the evening, we sat around on a campfire, we lit a fire, which incidentally showed out orange or red light or amber lights. Um, and then we ate some dinner and then we went to bed. So it got cooler, it got darker, we produced melatonin. Think what you do today. You go home, you go home, you turn the heating up because it's cold in the house. So rather than it getting cooler, you turn the heating up. You then switch some lights on because it's dark. White light, not amber light, not red light, white light. So white light and warmer temperatures destroy melatonin. And what do they produce? Well, if we're active and we're engaging, we're engaging with potentially television, uh, cell phones or stuff like that, we're producing cortisol and adrenaline. We're producing those performance things. <clears throat> so when was the light bulb invented? Anyone know? 1870s. So in the 1870s, it's disputed about who uh, invented it. Thomas Edison takes the credit, but there are several others if you, if you want to Google it. And then in 1930, the TV was invented. And again, Logie Baird claims it, but others also claim they're a part in it. And then in 2000s, the early 2000s, we invented the smartphone with blue light. So up until 1870, the only light we had was daylight or the amber or the reds or the, or the stuff like that, potentially gas light again uh, before the electric light, but gas light would have been a yellowy color, certainly not a bright white light. So going up to your bedroom at night and turning on the bathroom light to wash your teeth, a nice bright white light, destroys the melatonin just when you need it, when you're going to go to sleep. <clears throat> so for thousands, you know, millions of years, we've had no technology, no heating and no artificial light. 1,999,850 years without them and 150 years with them. Guess what? Our bodies have not changed. We have not evolved to be able to create melatonin when we're surrounding ourselves with stuff. So we need to plan our sleep. I said I'd refer to a book. It's a book called Sleep by Nick Littlehays. Very easy to remember, freely available on Amazon. It's about £4.50, I think, something like that. Now, Nick Littlehales describes himself as an elite sport sleep coach. Um, that always makes me smile when I think what he told his uh, careers teacher at school. I want to be an elite sport sleep coach when I grow up. He describes sleep as being a game of 90 minutes. Well, we've already talked about a sleep cycle being an hour and a half or 90 minutes. And the reason he calls it a game of 90 minutes is because he works extensively in sport and particularly in football. He worked with Manchester United uh, back in the days when Alex Ferguson was there and he went in and Alex Ferguson is seen in the games being a little bit of a dinosaur, a bit of, you know, one of the old school, not really one of these modern day uh, managers who's in tune with the players on a, on a well-being type front. But Alex Ferguson had the, uh, had the this guy had the ear of Alex Ferguson um, and he got Alex Ferguson to put in some uh, cots or camp beds at the training ground. 
and uh, why did he do that because what Alex Ferguson wanted he wanted the guys to train in the morning then have some lunch and then train again in the afternoon and he recognized or he was told by this guy Nick Littlayers that if after lunch they had a 90 minute lap nap then they would perform they would be able to perform again and be ready for the afternoon training session um, and that didn't work out too bad for Alex Ferguson in the early 2000s so sleep a game of 90 minutes we need to prepare to sleep for 90 minutes okay we've already said that we need five cycles but we need to prepare we need to cool down we need to get ready okay so what do we do in the 90 minutes before sleep well we avoid white light we avoid the blue light we avoid too much interaction with our cell phones preferably none whatsoever you can do stuff like get your things ready get your packed lunch ready for tomorrow that's okay. You could uh, do some ironing potentially. You can do some other things, start to unwind for the day, but nothing too interactive. You certainly don't want too much white light. So particularly in the bedroom. So if you can get like an amber light or a pink light bulb, something like that, that would be much better. Um, and certainly try and avoid the white bright light of the bathroom when you go in there to clean your teeth. Then we go into our sleep cycles, uh, five of 90 minutes, okay? In a perfect world. And then when we wake up, guess what? We need to wake up, we need to warm up for 90 minutes as well. Uh, and this is really important, uh, the warm up, because we can't expect to get out of bed and be able to perform straight away, okay? Uh, cortisol, um, the chemical that we talked about last week, the performance chemical, that starts to build in us um, in the latter part of our sleep. So the spike of cortisol is the piece of the circadian rhythm that wakes us up naturally first thing in the morning. Uh, how do you know about all this stuff? Well, there's wearable tech. I've already talked about napping, incidentally. Uh, the napping is the bit that we talked about there with um, Alex Ferguson. So a nap, incidentally, yep, you've got it, is 90 minutes long. So if you're going to have a nap, 90 minutes would be perfect. If you can't do 90, it's not the end of the world, but 90 would be the perfect. 30 minutes is okay. Not quite as good, but I say 90 would be the perfect nap. So how do we plan our sleep? You need to work backwards from the time you need to perform. So let's assume I need to be, uh, let's assume I need to be at work at eight o'clock in the morning, okay? So I need to work back from there. So I need a warm up an hour and a half. So eight o'clock would take me back to 6.30. I then need seven and a half hours. So I need to go back seven and a half hours from 6.30 in the morning, which takes me to 11 o'clock the night before. And then I need to start my warm up 90 minutes before that. So I would start to prepare for sleep in an ideal world at 9.30. So at 9.30, TV off, cell phone away, and start to prepare. Start to do the cool down, start to avoid the white light, start to perhaps get the curtains cooled. And if, and incidentally, if you've got curtains at home, um, if you've got some blackout blinds, that's even better, particularly at this time of year. Uh, there's nothing worse than having the light come through the curtains. Um, caffeine as well. Don't just avoid caffeine, incidentally, for that cool down period of 90 minutes. Caffeine you need to start to avoid probably well, the experts will say two o'clock in the afternoon um, because of the half-life of caffeine. Um, it does hang around in the system an awful long time. So if caffeine affects you, two o'clock, go on to other drinks, water. Um, but yeah, avoid the caffeine. And also avoid too much hydration, uh, particularly in that last 90 minutes, because there's nothing worse than being woken by a full bladder at two or three o'clock in the morning, because that's one of the reasons that you will wake up. Um, also in the cool down period, what's really important is to get rid of the stuff in your head, the stuff that cortisol and adrenaline is producing, the things that are stressing us. And this is where we come back to the breathing exercises. Last week, I spoke to you about the breathing exercises and someone asked a question, when should we do it and how long should we do it for? And I said, do it as often as you can. You know, 20 seconds is great. In for five, out for five, in for five, out for five. That's great. If you can do this, the breathing exercises, once you've done your cool down and you've got into bed and the light's out, if you can then start the breathing exercises and you can do what we call a lock-in, which lasts for eight, nine minutes, um, 
there is some music that uh, you can get with the heart math tool it's a bit like what i call lift music uh, certainly not jeremy clarkson's top gear hits it's no heavy metal it's very soothing um, calm music and a lot of the apps have it these days a lot of the apps you know the breathe app the calm app there's there's music on there that will help you um, to do that uh, if you can do the lock in, breathe in, out, change to a positive emotion for eight, nine minutes before you go to sleep. If When you get into the zone, you'll find that actually you'll be asleep probably long before that time. Um, and I, I spoke last week about some of the elite sports people that we work with, um, and they actually use this uh, when, the, when, the, when the captain comes on the aircraft and says 20 minutes to land in. So if they're on a long haul flight, 20 minutes to land in, they do a lock in for eight or nine minutes. It helps to reset their systems ready so that they're, um, they're ready to perform when they get to, the, uh, get to their new destination. So the cool down, reduce blue and white light. So that's the artificial light. Manage the temperature. The perfect temperature for sleep is around 16 to 18 degrees. OK, so that's what your bedroom temperature needs to be. at. I don't think the thermostat in my house ever goes below about 23, but hey ho, uh, 18 degrees is the perfect toilet and hydration levels. You need to be hydrated enough so you don't wake up needing water. And we've all we've all taken a pint of water to bed with this when we've had too much alcohol um, and then have to keep waking up and drinking water all through the night. And um, we've all woken up when we've had too much to drink and we then need to empty the bowel as well. So so emptying the bladder and getting everything ready is part of the cool down, making sure you're in a fit state, ready to sleep. Caffeine, sugar and nutrition. Declutter the sleep environment. Get rid of the tech. Secure the house, make sure that you're mentally safe and secure and the lock in, the breathing exercises. OK, very, very good at getting rid of the stuff. Most of us don't have a problem getting to sleep. A lot of us have a problem staying asleep. And it's that spike at one, two, three o'clock in the morning that wakes us up. And then we don't think we can get back to sleep. So know your sleep, wearable tech. Um, I guess in a lot of you probably have something like a Fitbit. This is a screenshot from my Fitbit. Fitbit, just a nice, just a simple watch. There you go. I'm wearing mine now. I wear it 24 seven. Um, it tells me how many steps I've done um, in a day. It tells me what my heart rate is. It tells me all sorts of information. But the good thing, the thing that I really love about it is it tells me what my sleep is. So here you can see, this is an actual screenshot from, uh, from my Fitbit. It downloads onto your, uh, onto your PC and that as well. So you can pull data off of there. So this is a screenshot. So let's go through the elements. I said to you earlier, there were four elements of sleep. Light sleep, I'll read this to you. It's important because this is when your body processes memories and emotions and your metabolism regulates itself. So there's a lot of body maintenance occurring during lighter stages of sleep. And, and this makes up most of your sleep. Um, and light sleep, as you can see here, is the third one down. Um, and we go from awake into light sleep first. So light sleep is the first stage of sleep. So we go to light and we actually spend, normally I spend about 50% of my time in light sleep. You think, oh, wow, that's not very good. Um, but actually it's perfectly normal, okay? So light sleep is important for us. Deep sleep, so following on from light sleep, we go into deep sleep and it's good. If you get four deep sleeps a night in your five cycles, that would, again would be a great scenario. You can see here on the right hand side, I did have four deep sleeps on this particular night. So deep sleep is good for long term memory and learning. It's also good for growth and development of the body. So the older you get, the less you spend in deep sleep, because actually the growth and development of our body is not occurring so much as it does when we're kids. Incidentally, deep sleep is the one we're in when we miss the thunderstorm or where we miss, you know, anything can happen and we wouldn't hear it. If you are woken from a deep sleep, you will be absolutely shattered. OK, so not good to be woken out of a deep sleep. So if you're in a deep sleep when the alarm goes off, not good news. You're probably not going to have a great day the next day. Uh, again, a really important reason why we need to plan our sleep so we're not waking out of deep. REM or rapid eye movement stimulates the areas of your brain that are essential in learning and making or retaining memories. It's also where you have most of your dreams. Your body will prioritize REM sleep when it needs recharging. And we nearly always wake, certainly naturally, from the REM stage. That's why sometimes we remember our dreams because they were literally just happening seconds ago. Um, so you wake, you normally wake from REM. 
And then finally, uh, we've got awake or nearly awake. Um, and again, perfectly normal. You know, I sometimes look at my trace and I see up here, this is actually quite a good night. Quite often there's quite a lot of these red, but they're very short. Um, but if something happened, if there was a noise or something else going on whilst I was in the nearly awake stage, it could then potentially wake me. The important thing to remember here though, is like when you do wake at two or three o'clock in the morning, let's say we wake up at two o'clock in the morning and you're now struggling to get back to sleep. Think about what time it is that you're going to be getting up. You're planning to get it up. Let's say you're going to get up at seven o'clock. So you've still got five hours. Well, five hours divided by your hour and a half cycles is four and a half, and you've got 30 minutes spare. So those 30 minutes are a waste. You don't need those 30 minutes because it's not an hour and a half cycle. So you've still got plenty of time between two and seven to get three additional cycles in. So rather than lie there thinking, I've got to get back to sleep, I've got to get back to sleep, you've now got 30 minutes to get back to sleep and you still then get your three cycles. So awaking in the middle of the night, not the end of the world, quick mental calculation, you've still got your 30 minutes. And now 30 minutes to get back to sleep seems like an eternity, and you'll probably drop off, do the breathing exercises, positive emotion, and you will get back to sleep. So the wearable tech is great. Also with Fitbit, you get daily and weekly data. So again, on the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see my, my daily scores. They've recently introduced these daily scores, so 80. Uh, uh, I'm normally good. My, my, my weekly average over the last year and a half is probably about 86, 87. Um, and you can see my daily average is 7 hours, 54 minutes. So I've 24 minutes of wasted sleep every single night. 24 minutes. I'm never going to get back in my life that I didn't need to be sleeping. Hey-ho. Knowledge is power take control. If you understand sleep, if you understand what's important, if you understand the benefits from good sleep, and you more importantly understand how to sleep and work on it and work back from when you need to get up, you will begin to take control. And there's lots of gadgets out there as well that you can help with. So the warm up, breakfast is critical. Uh, I mean, we'll come back to this when we do nutrition and hydration, but breakfast is critical. Certainly from a, from a dietary perspective, it starts, the, it starts the, the body working, it starts the body. If you don't eat breakfast, basically the body starts to hang on to the food from the day before because the body doesn't know when it's going to get fed again. So it hangs on to food and says, right, well, I'm not going to start burning it off just yet and it'll turn to fat. So breakfast is critical, even if it's only a piece of dry toast. So something for breakfast is good. But if you start to plan this 90 minutes, you'll find that you will actually be hungry. And of course, the other good thing about being hungry at breakfast is you haven't eaten too late the night before. So again, another critical part of uh, nutrition that, that we'll cover next week. Some gentle exercise. Uh, mine tends to be walking around the house, um, but you can get outside, get some light. Again, we've already discussed about, about for, you know, 999 um, thousand years we've been used to getting light uh, we woke up in the light so get some proper light not just artificial light give yourself a chance to wake up get more focused and better concentration levels start to plan what you're doing for the day okay live the island life or try to imagine how you would have lived had you been on an island okay so in summary, firstly, you need to understand your sleep and more importantly, uh, understand sleep and more importantly, your sleep, okay? Whether you're a lark, whether you're a night owl, whatever it might be. Then plan your sleeping hours. Important, this really important, like you plan your waking hours. Not many of us just get up and just see what happens during the day. We have a plan for the day. So have a plan for sleeping as well because it's a really important part of your life. Um, and then monitor your sleep with some wearable tech. It's dead easy to do. You know, it, it's really, really, really not difficult. Um, uh, and also uh, useful for diet and exercise as well. Uh, like the Fitbit, for instance, you can record all the food that you put in. It tells you the calorific value um, and it records your steps and exercise and cycling. And there's even waterproof ones now that you can wear while swimming. Um, and then the simple techniques that we discussed here will most definitely help you with the amount but more importantly, the quality of your sleep. Okay, question times. I'll hand back to Ian. Hi, Andy, you're all right. You can leave the presentation up if you like. Don't need to hand back presenter mode. I can join you with that. 
Uh, great. Uh, I, I just woke up from my hour and a half. Has it been an hour and a half? I've just had my 90 minute cycle. Uh, didn't quite get to the warm up stage. So I'm going to I'm going to eat my biscuits now to try and give myself some breakfast and warm up again. Uh, we've had some a, a couple of queries, actually questions along the way, um, if I may. Uh, yeah, the first do. was about the, um, the, the two litres. Um, does is that could it be anything? Tea, coffee? Does it have to be water? Uh, water's best. Uh, I know tea and coffee. Well, I came on later to cover off the caffeine element. Uh, decaf tea, decaf coffee after two o'clock. But yeah, it's, I, I'm not great. I mean, I drink too much coffee. I know I do. Um, but I, you know, two liters of water is great. Uh, there's these hi hydration drinks, Lucas Aid and, and, and other brands obviously available. Yeah, two wa water's great. And you know, I, I have this, I carry this with me all the time now. It's a bobble, it's filtered water. You can fill it up from anywhere. It's got the filter in it. Uh, it's also good at weight loss actually, because if you fill yourself up with water, um, you're not filling yourself up with other stuff that probably not quite so good for you. But again, we'll come back to that next week in nutrition and hydration. It sure will. And um, uh, Claire asks, can your wearable tech record awake time and you don't even know you've been awake? Uh, yes, it, it does record. So the red bit at the top was the was the awake time. So certainly the Fitbit does uh, it records and then it gives you uh, the analysis as well, tells you uh, whatever 10 percent of the time you're awake. But don't don't get too hung up on the awake bit because it's awake stroke nearly awake. It's not. It's it's one of the four cycles that we go through. I mean, we go light, deep, REM, awake, and that's the way it always goes. So yeah, there you go. Ian showing you his live. So ah, live feed. The, was red, that... the red section on that is showing you the awake section. Um, yeah. I just picked one that I was awake for a while, and that's I think that was forty nine minutes or something. But yeah, that's um, quite a long one. Yeah, you were worried. You were worried about today, and that's what it was. Obviously, <laughs> it was last night. And uh, Barry says, "Do you need less sleep as you get older?" Yep, absolutely. Um, again, one of the areas there we went through what each area does. One of the areas was uh, was big on growth, and uh, you know the only growing our bodies do these days are normally outwards rather than upwards. So yeah, you do. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you get up early in the morning and walk around, and the world's full of old people like me isn't it getting their morning power in fact i'd stopped for a coffee on the way into work this morning there was an, an old boy on his bike chatting to someone outside the coffee shop and i said no phil how are you and phil went yeah he said uh, he said oh have you just been for your paper he said no i was up at four he said i'll do two paper rounds uh he said and then i've been down the garden and this is like half a state in the morning and he's going back he's done two paper rounds he's on his bike and now and he's been to the garden to get his vegetables for the day as well so yeah old people half four in the morning there you go and my wife I think uh, my my brain still thinks I'm a teenager then because it it could sleep all weekend given half a chance. <laughs> yeah, you are definitely uh, a night owl, Ian. There's, um, <laughs> there's lots of studies actually about uh, teenagers particularly. I'm just thinking about the type of audience we got. Um, massive study in America showing that when they moved the times when people started school a bit later, it was about an hour later than normal. It had a massive impact on their learning. Um, teenagers particularly need more sleep than probably anybody else apart from babies so uh, it's quite important that they get it so the, the guys that are saying oh I'm really tired and I didn't get enough sleep but it's probably actually true um, uh, so. uh, and, and just to add to that if you wake them up out of the deep sleep that's why they're grumpy so you need <laughs> to you need to you need to find their REM bit and make sure they get up at the REM bit when you hear them moving go and get them up don't go and rattle their cage when they're in a deep sleep because that's going to be not a great place to be. It is a good point though um, for instructors to bear in mind and talk to their customers about and to, to kind of bear in mind whether they are that you know what kind of cycle they best fit into are they a night tower are they somebody who does perform better in the mornings it is really really uh, key and that they have a discussion with their customers about uh, sleep routines and things like that, getting them ready, especially for their driving test, of course, because they they want to prepare at their best for the driving test, don't they? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I mean, Vanessa and I are classic. She, you know, I was a night owl. She's an early bird, so she always wants to talk to me first thing in the morning. Well, after living together for twenty years, we do now understand. She she now understands that I'm not just miserable. It's just that I haven't woken up yet, so trying to have a conversation with me at five five thirty in the morning is not going to have a great result. You know, it's going to be grunting. Um, so yeah, it's really important 
to understand our physiology as it applies to you know everything what we talked about last week our our, our response to uh, stress our response our emotional response again we're going to come back to emotions further on down the line how it's better how we can manage those best but yeah sleep is really important understanding each other's physiology and the fact that we're all the same but we're all different it's really key and would you say as well uh, somebody asked about the you know you you put the perfect sleep down as being that five cycles um, yep. does that apply to like any age um because uh where was it now sorry i think it was clear clear asked about children teenagers you know people at different ages and we just said that you know older people need less sleep so does that number of cycles change in your life um, Yes, I mean everyone, everyone's different. Obviously, these are these are generic things. But but the but the hour and a half sleep cycle, if you can do if you can do that five of those four times a week. So again, particularly when we're when we're when we're working in corporate land, and particularly with night shift workers, they say, "Well, well I do three night shifts a week, mate." You know, and and I say to them, "Okay, fine, but you know, you need to manage. You still need to have a plan, and and the plan, you know, if you're doing three night shifts." There's four four days where you're not doing a night shift, and and they don't have to the, the hour and a half don't have to be. You could do four at night and one in the afternoon, mm. you know. So that's still five cycles. So five cycles is the perfect, but you know you may be someone like Maggie Thatcher that can survive on three hours a night. I, you know who who knows? So we are all different, but the hour and a half is the important part because that's the full cycle, um, and then you'll find out whether you can manage on four or five. But five right. is pretty pretty much. Most of the sleep books recommend an absolute minimum of three cycles, um, but ideally four to five. So, yeah, is there somebody uh, Matt asks? Is there any kind of uh, an alarm that would actually monitor you and know when you're in REM sleep to actually wake you at that point? Yeah, you can get you can get apps on your phone that do that. They're not absolutely 100% accurate because um, they tend to fit underneath you um, duvet or whatever. Um, but you can get apps that do that. The the one thing that works very nicely is using light. So we've got uh, light bulbs that connect to Wi-Fi and we'll set them to a certain time, ideally in sleep time. Uh, but that means that because it's not a noise, you'll tend to wake up more naturally with the light. So if you weren't quite, if you're still in a deep cycle, it wouldn't quite get you out of the sleep. The best way is with light. And like Andy said, that's because we've done that for how many years? Millions of years. Wow. Uh, the, the planning the planning is the key Ian. um as, as i said you know if you wake up at two in the morning and you've got four hours left and actually you've only got three because a, that's only two cycles so you've got an hour to get back to sleep so it really is about the planning and when um nick littlehales the sleep author when he first started working with british cycling he went in there and he said to people okay what are you a night owl or, and none of them knew what they were none of them knew what a sleep cycle was i mean we did the poll and we saw you know most of us didn't know what a sleep cycle was most of us didn't know how many we were supposed to have if we don't know this stuff how are we going to be able to do it so he went back a month later and every single member of the british cycling team knew what they were knew what their cycle was and had started to plan better and, and that's what these elite sports coaches these do these days to get the best performance out of their athletes as i said last week they work on their they work on their hydration they work on their emotional responses they work on their nutrition and they work on their sleep um, and we're no different, we're human beings. And if we want to get the best out of us, it's really important that we understand. And then, But planning is the key. If you can plan it, there's a lot you can do, very inexpensively there's to do a, this stuff. There's a brilliant example of that in uh, some of the books, and I think it's in the Little Hales book. Um, and he says that when they uh, the teams move abroad, so if they went to Australia or you got a 12 hour difference, um, they'd leave to make sure there was 12, hour, 12 um, days prior to make sure that they, stage the sleep wake ups and go to sleep at the right time so they get people out of that jet lag uh, situation so once they get to day one of the events they're actually ready to go and in the best performance stage if you like yeah i think um it's possible isn't it through training to to change yourself from like being a night owl um and i know i don't i don't think i, I did it in this way i didn't deliberately do it but but when i changed from the, the my past employment being um running nightclubs etc it it did require some changes to me and my lifestyle and what i thought about and without even realizing it i suppose what i was doing was that planning was going through how i was going to plan my sleep and thinking yeah. about the hours i needed and how i was going to change my my cycle around uh, so it is possible to retrain isn't it as, as a couple of people have asked 
Um, yeah, abs we absolutely. Just on that point, and when we when we do with the night shift guys, it's weird. I say to the to the to the guys, predominantly network rail guys. I say, so what do you do when you get home? I bet you race home and get into bed, don't they? And they go, yeah, yeah. And I go, strange that, because if I finish work at five o'clock tonight, I don't race home and go to bed. I go home, you know. I, I go for a walk. I, I make my tea. I sit down. I watch a bit of TV. I chill out. I relax. And I might go to bed at half eight, nine, nine thirty, whatever it might be. I might go out, have a beer. I said, so why don't you do that? Why don't you, when you get home from work at six o'clock, six thirty in the morning, you know, plan it, do, have some breakfast, chill out, relax. You still need to do your ninety-minute cool down before you go to sleep or try to go to sleep. You're not gonna just stop. You know, and when I do these things for the night shift workers and I'm standing in a hotel at two o'clock in the morning and I finish at two o'clock, I'm buzzing. You know, I'm full of cortisol and adrenaline and then else I go to my room and I probably never get to sleep before half three, four. So if I've arranged something for eight o'clock next morning, I mean, that's just stupid. You know, I'm not going to be able to do it. So it's understanding and planning and then that will help a lot of things. We is there more did you say next week with regards to like water and drinking and everything with yeah. the nutrition one so that would yeah. be great so i think yeah. nutrition and hydration yeah. yeah yeah um there's a lot of questions about that and it might we've got a different presenter next week as well so it, it might be that he he's probably better placed to answer those questions to be honest as well so yeah we've got a guest yeah. appearance next week from uh, my colleague john sunderland right who started the performance on demand brand with us uh, back in 2008 um and what he doesn't know isn't worth knowing so according to him anyway we'll have lots of fun anyway yeah. <laughs> good um we, we there's, there's lots of comments and I, I do appreciate this being an instructor myself for 15 years as well it's never easy if you're drinking a lot during the day to think where are you then going to go to the toilet and that is something else that you can do <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. there's only so many mcdonald's aren't there so yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah. of course that, that also gets more difficult with age as well <laughs> that too needs a lot of planning so yeah. Uh, yeah definitely got to build that into your plan um well i think i mean there, there's a lots of continuing comments around that nutrition side of things the the fluids so i think that's something that we'll come back to you next week as you yeah. quite rightly point out um and I, I think we've got pretty much to most of the other comments there as well so it's just just having like another quick rundown uh nice few nice comments coming in clear saying another great session thank you very much we've had a few thank yous already for people who've had to to go out of session already and left their thank yous um oh uh, joanna asks is there any advice you could quickly give with regards to somebody who is having a sleep crisis bearing in mind instructors are going through appointments during the day let's say they finish their morning appointments they've got a short half an hour break before they go back out again and they're having a bit of a down really feeling drowsy and fatigued is there anything they could do to try and change that around for themselves yeah don't, don't fight it you can't fight sleep as i said right on the first slide if, if you're tired it's too late so uh, a nap uh, you know napping is great There's nothing wrong with a nap um uh, you know, it, it, it's, in, it's an important part. I say hour and a half would be the perfect nap. But again, Nick Little Hales in his book talks about the 30 minute nap. Well worth getting that book. It's really easy um, to read. I mean, I'm not the brightest guy in the world and, and I get it. It's, it's, it. it's written in words, one syllable. It's, 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 it's a really, really, really good read. Um, dead easy to read. Um, so yeah, so get that. There's this whole, whole chapter on napping. Great. I think the other Thanks, thing is that that situation you just explained in between uh, lessons and things, uh, I've certainly done what's just been suggested, the sort of nap thing. You usually find uh, somewhere quiet, round, you know, around the corner from where I'm going to be next, uh, and set an alarm and just have, you know, 20 minutes or so. And then the, the other thing there is, uh, like Andy said on the first week, he's looking at breathing, you know, doing some breathing techniques, etc. cetera. Um, maybe you might have a lot on your mind. Uh, some of our clients have um, made some suggestions that we make some notes in that scenario. Uh, just because you might have a lot on your mind at that point, it's a good thing to do. So, yeah, but there's no substitute for sleep, unfortunately. Could I just say, uh, Andy or Ian, would you send the title of that book to uh, Andy Mitchell ready for the red line going out so that he could include yep. the title? Thank you. Yep. Um, and yeah, that's great. So thanks, everyone. Um, please stay on the line if you can, if you can be with us a few minutes after the close of play, uh, just to sort of answer the survey. Uh, thanks today for uh, such a great presentation. Loads of really, really nice feedback already coming in. 
so uh, our thanks to Andy Neal and Ian Westmore, uh, both over at NFV Group and Pod. Uh, so, and we look forward to seeing you again next Friday, everyone. Anything else, Andy or Ian, to wrap up and finish? No, don't miss next week. Don't miss the Mad Scouser, John. Um, uh, worth listening to. So, see you next week at 10:30. Stay safe. I'm gonna- I'm going to plan my sleep cycle ready for it, ready. I'm going to write it all out so I know exactly what time I've got to go to bed on Thursday night. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much, everyone. Cheers, bye. Bye.